Welcome back to the Unbeatable Mind Podcast. This is Mark Devine, your host. Thanks so much for joining me today. Super appreciate your time and your attention. Do not take it lightly and we will not waste it. I have my good friend, Brian Johnson, founder of Optimize and now Heroic with me. Brian, I think this is the first time I've had you on my podcast. Is that correct? I know I've had you on mine at least once. And I, f- I feel like we might have had a chat before, but it's so good to see you. It's good to see you as well. Here virtually. Thank you for uh, anointing my uh, pull-up bar tree the other day. Uh, <laughs> of always fun to connect. Yeah, it was great to come down to Texas and to see you and to you know, explore your beautiful piece of property and the heroic founding headquarters. It's pretty exciting. Let's go. <laughs> I know. It's pretty awesome. You know, I've known you for some time and I want to my style here is very just conversation. Let's get to know each other. Let's talk about things that are important. I obviously want to talk about heroic and, and your mission and you know what you're already accomplishing over there, which is pretty cool. But um, let's talk about first kind of the formative, you know, what made Brian Johnson, Brian Johnson? What were the challenges of your life and how did you um, shape yourself as a philosopher CEO in the formative stages? That's a good question. And, you know, the immediate answer that comes up is, well, we got to go all the way back. (laughs) You know, (laughs) often we do. We got to go all the way back to a really conservative Catholic upbringing. My father was an alcoholic, good man, hard worker, but struggled with alcohol. His dad struggled with alcohol, ended his own life, you know, and just a really, you know, committed family, but just a lot of those challenges that, that arise in that environment, which certainly shaped me as the youngest of five. Again, good Catholic boy for 12 years. UCLA undergrad, thought it'd be awesome to work for the biggest professional consulting services firm in the world, which is why I loved you so much when I first found Unbeatable Mind. I'm like, another guy that left. Yeah. For me, it was the big six at the time, you know. But right. Which firm were you with? Arthur Anderson, before it imploded. Oh, yeah. So was I. Yeah. No way. I thought you were EY. No, no, no. I was with Coopers, which became Coopers. Price Waterhouse Coopers for two years. I just don't talk about this much because it's kind of complicated, but I took a short sabbatical I was going to go skiing for a winter and, and work at a ski resort, but it didn't snow out in Tahoe. I ran out of money. <laughs> so I, I crawled back to Wall Street with my tail between my leg and got hired by Arthur Anderson. So I worked for them for I two years. I did not know that. And you were audit, right? CPA? With Anderson, I was an auditor with PwC, but with Anderson, I was in something called special services, yeah, which is kind of cool that. because that's I became weird. special forces later. But Oh, that's so good. <laughs> So I think I hold the record for most service lines in a year. I started an audit, then I went to tax, then I went to financial planning, then I went to special services, which was their take on consulting before Accenture yeah. evolved. I don't know about you, but my, my job in special services was basically photocopying a shitload of it documents. It was a lot of fun, wasn't it? Yeah. So, <laughs> so I quickly left there. And to put it in perspective, on the way home from work, first week, Driving on the 405, I pulled off on the shoulder and threw up. I knew that was not what I wanted to do. <laughs> so I immediately started studying for the LSAT. And I thought that would be my escape valve. And I'm first generation college student. You know, this is all new for me, right? Yeah, you're figuring this out alone. Figuring it out. And so studied for the LSAT. That was a sport for me. I loved the logical precision. Got into a, a top 10 school, went to the public school. You know, there's the cheapest, Berkeley, right? But I threw up when I moved in there. Literally, I moved in my, oh my apartment. Gosh. Dude, this isn't it. It's really funny. There's been three times so, in my so life. So you're a very intuitive person, obviously. So your body tells you. That's fascinating. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, in a subtle way, that's obviously not subtle at all. But there was right. one other significant time where I almost took an opportunity to build something that I didn't. But anyway, you know, I knew law school wasn't for me. And dropping out was really, really tough, you know, and I spun out. I was about 22 years old, maybe 23 at that time. Moved back in with mom, and literally the only two things I knew I wanted to do were coach a Little League baseball team, and then, as I share in a documentary, Finding Joe, where I talk about kind of my hero's journey in this context, you know, I thought about creative ways to end my life. I couldn't figure out how I would use this passion I had in a world that just seemed so weird, you know, that I got to go do this and had none of the skills that I've developed over the last 25 years, which is one of the reasons I'm such a big advocate for the fundamentals and all the things I talk about. Right. I know what it's like to be on the other side of it. Anyway, I coached this Little League baseball team, thankfully had the insight to uh, continue on. And in the process... You mean continue on with the human existence? Yeah. I mean, in an existential sense, you know, and it was a profound experience for me that, again, has really humbled me and I think given me an opportunity to say, I know what it feels like to feel that. And I have goosebumps right now. Can I pause for a second and hold that thought? I'm really sorry, but you brought something to my mind, which I think is important. I don't think you're alone 
obviously you're not alone, but I think it's a fairly common stage to go through that existential crisis where you're just questioning existence and why, why am I on this planet? Everything seems confusing and crazy and what's it all about? That kind of nihilistic stage really is common from 16, 17 to about 21, 22. I went through it myself. I think most listeners are probably like, yeah, but we have these support structures around us to where, you know, you don't go all the way to the edge. And I think what's challenging in our world right now, Brian, is that a lot of those support structures have been torn apart. And so people are going to the edge and they don't have anything to pull them back. This is why suicide is such a problem these days. I just wanted to talk about that. And I don't want to go down that rabbit hole too much, but I'm putting that out there. That's why what you're doing and what I'm doing is so important. You know, that's why I have so much respect for what you're doing with Burpees for Vets, you know, and just why we were honored to be able to support you in the last campaign. And um, it's no joke, you know, and there are skills that we can engage in and practices, of course, we can engage in to get those structures to help us navigate those tough times and come out stronger. And of course, that's what we're all about with Unbeatable and Optimized and Heroic. But specifically, you know, some of my big challenges. specifically for this group, though, that's 17 to 22 or 16, whatever age, is probably getting younger and younger than when you, know, when you and I, because people are maturing earlier, well, or not. And so they're all in these silos on TikTok and YouTube, which are kind of supporting their nihilistic tendencies. And so I think heroic is a big part of that. Like if we can capture these people or catch these people young when they're having these issues, then, you know, we can deal with it. We can help them out because suicide rates amongst young people are skyrocketing, not just in the United States, but globally. And it's because yeah. it's this kind of very philosophical underpinning of they've got this existential crisis, which naturally happens. Like we've all been there as you're growing out of the family structures and you're trying to poke your toe into the world of the unknown. And you're just like, what's it all about? That's your first question. First time you ask, who am I is about like 18, 19 years old. And um, if you don't have a good structure, mentorship, you know, a coach or even a family there to, to fall back on, and your only source of income or information is TikTok, right? It's a real problem. Good luck. Yeah, good yeah, luck. Good luck with know. that. Yeah. So we've got to figure out how to help that stage of development as you step out in the world. My next book is, is all geared toward that population. It's called Uncommon. I want to figure out how to mm. really help them because it's, you know, helping you and I helping each other, whatever, right? <laughs> We've got a lot of good habits and, and tools, you know? Yeah, yeah. And then bringing it back to, and kind of threading it. So what brought me to this point was that those, you asked me what my biggest challenges were, and those certainly are going to start framing that. But I always had this impulse to understand what it is that makes great people great. And that was kind of how I framed it when I was a young man. And I was introduced to Stephen Covey. Arthur Anderson flew me to a leadership event before my senior year at UCLA. And as a conservative Catholic upbringing kid, you know, I had no idea that you could actually consciously, deliberately create a life of meaning. So being introduced to Seven Habits was literally transformative for me. And so I always wanted to understand at a, you know, level that was subconscious and unconscious, what makes great people great? And at the time, UCLA, you know, was focused on autism, not positive psychology. So literally chatted with Martin Seligman two nights ago about what he's done and how he's impacted me. But in 96, when I graduated, none of that stuff existed. Mm -hmm. So that's why I went to Arthur Anderson. Then I went to law school. But I always had that inkling. But what wound up happening was dropped out of law school, moved back in with mom at 23, coached a Little League baseball team. Now, at Arthur Anderson, in addition to photocopying reams of papers, <laughs> I also did some database consulting at a high level, just like understanding scalable technology. Mm -hmm. And I could see that in a matter of time, every single Little League baseball team, AOSO soccer team, this is 1997, would be online like an ESPN for youth sports. Mm -hmm. And then I pushed on that idea. And I wound up creating a company. We wound up winning the business plan competition at UCLA's Anderson School. We wound up raising $5 million. We wound up hiring the CEO of Adidas to replace me. And, and I share this in the documentary, we wound up hiring the law firm Oh, Melvin and Myers that I would have wanted to work for before I would have graduated. So there's this Joseph Campbell, who's one of my heroes in the back wall there. You know, he mm -hmm. taught us that one of the jumping off points into enlightenment is, you know, there's Sat, Chit, and Ananda, consciousness, mm -hmm. beingness, and bliss, Ananda. So actually following your bliss is a 2,500-year-old path to enlightenment. Mm -hmm. So I knew law school wasn't for me. And the only thing I knew I wanted to do was coach this Little League baseball team. And by following that little bit of joy in my life at that point, something miraculous happened that I never could have anticipated. 
And that was my first arc through the hero's journey, which has now become my life's mission to understand that and to become a guide for all of us, really, you know, but especially to your point, that younger generation. But frankly, all of us, as Campbell says, a good life is one hero's journey after another. That's right. So reframing those challenges as fuel for our heroic growth, as you know, is a big part of my work and, of course, yours, and you've deeply inspired me and in, in my kind of approach to things. But those are some of the challenges and kind of the origin story of what got me to this point and why I'm so committed to these ideas. I love that. I love Campbell's work and on archetypes and whatnot. And what you said is is mostly true, right? Everyone's life is one journey after another, but it, it takes intention and self-awareness to make it a hero's journey. A good right. life, I said. I did qualify it. Are you going to push on <laughs> that, Mark? I qualified it. A good life. A good life. A good life is one. Well, I can push after back on that is that everyone is a good person, you know, at their core. And self-awareness is what brings that goodness to the surface to where they're aware of, it, aware of it and then they can share it with others. But the semantics aside, I love that distinction. You know, there's probably a, some sort of nomenclature we come up with to really define like the arc of a whole life as a hero's journey versus the small little journeys that we have to go through to get our, you know, where we bloody our fingers and stub our toes and, you know, fall back and gain the skills and knowledge to overcome the, whatever current mission or whatever current perspective we have on our hero's journey. So you're right. There's these, it's almost like linking micro goals to them, to the macro goal of the purpose, to the vision. The human life is like that. And I think the hero's journey is such a profound metaphor. Can you walk us through kind of your perspective, of the hero's journey? Cause we have ours and, and there's slightly um, different kind of um, ways you can look at the hero's journey. And I love, love to have your perspective and, and how you teach it. Cause you're really grounded in stoicism and kind of philosophical frameworks that most people aren't used to these days because it's not really taught anymore. Yeah, I appreciate it. And um, yeah, and such a rich conversation and a rich frame. Again, I've mentioned it now for the third time, but Finding Joe is a great documentary that the documentarian put online for free now, Finding Joe the movie on YouTube. Oh, I happen to be in it with Deepak and Laird Hamilton and Tony Hawk and guys like that. But, you know, there's, there's a complex kind of frame for it. And again, to your point, you can interpret it a number of ways, but I think there are three central components to the hero's journey. First of all, the hero feels a call and they're willing to enter the unknown. Mm -hmm. That's step one. Step two is they go on the journey, right? Mm -hmm. So they fight the dragons, they battle the demons, and they hopefully win or learn and come back, which is the third part, and they return. They return with the boon. They return stronger than when they departed. Mm -hmm. But those are the three basic elements as I see the hero's journey. You're willing to enter the unknown. And Campbell says, the only sure sign you're not on the right path is there's a path. If there's a path, you're following <laughs> someone else's dharma. You need to be willing to go to the darkest point where you're trusting yourself and you're, you have that self-awareness to embark on it. And you got to pay attention to that phone that's ringing, that's telling you there's something more. For me, in a few moments, it was very visceral. There was a physical, this is not right, sense. But it still took courage for me to actually pay attention to that. Everyone told me, you're at a top 10 law school, dude, just stick it out. You mm -hmm. know, two and a half more years, come on, you can figure it out. But it wasn't right for me. Anyway, that willingness to enter the unknown requires the virtue of courage, of course. Mm -hmm. um, and we can unpack this in terms of how my philosophy has evolved. But then you go do the work. You show up. You get a guide who mm -hmm. helps you. You were one of my big guides. I blew up, as you know, a business eight, nine years ago. And I literally remember reading Unbeatable Mind. Of, this is exactly what I need right now, baby. Like, give me that unbeatable mind. So a hero gets a guide. Right. And the guide, whether it's Harry Potter getting Dumbledore or, you know, Neo getting Morpheus or Frodo and Gandalf, insert your favorite story. All heroes' journeys follow the same arc. They also get no travelers who go with them, you know, as Hermione and Ron or whatever. But then you do the work, the hard work, very importantly. And this is what I love about Campbell and the good life. Again, we're all good people, unquestionably. Mm -hmm. Seduced by TikTok to think we should play the wrong game, which is why all my work starts with, no, 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 wake up. That's the game to play. Go put mm -hmm. your virtues in action. Be the best version of yourself. And so you can live heroically my whole life in two <laughs> tattoos, right? Art and heroic. Anyway. Wait, pause there because a lot of people aren't watching this video. So yeah. you pointed to your left arm and you had the word arate, right? Which I think means excellence, right? Or we, living We translate it. So the super quick frame on that, and then we'll come back to the specifics yeah. on the hero's journey, although it's related. So one of the things I teach is you got to know the game you're playing. And so what I've done, and I've studied ancient wisdom, modern science, and, and, you know, hopefully learned a few things. But what I like to say is let's invite Aristotle and Martin Seligman as proxies for ancient wisdom, modern science, and ask them, gentlemen, 
what's the ultimate purpose of life? They will give us the exact same one word answer. Aristotle will say eudaimonia. This is the summum bonum, the highest good, what we should all aspire to. Eudaimon is good soul. Now, okay, that's interesting. But while he says that uh, Martin Seligman, and I shared this story with him two days ago, she's shaking his head and holds up his book. His most recent book is called Flourish, which is the English translation of eudaimonia. The ultimate purpose of life is to flourish, to express the best version of ourselves. So then you say, okay, cool, got it, coherence. One word answer. That's interesting. Ancient wisdom, modern science. How do we do that? And Aristotle will answer in a single word, which is the word I tattooed on my right forearm, which is arate. Now we translate arate as virtue or excellence, but it has some deeper, you know, almost ineffable meaning, which is be the best version of yourself. And I like to represent it as if you're capable of being this, and I'm drawing a line with my hand right now, but there's a gap and you're being someone less than that. You are not living with RT and you will experience regret, anxiety, disillusionment, depression. If you close the gap, never perfectly, but more and more consistently, boom, you're living with RT, you experience eudaimonia. Mm -hmm. Now, again, Seligman would say exactly. He founded the positive psychology movement on virtue. The mm -hmm. first thing they did was study every ancient wisdom tradition. And they literally, the bedrock of positive psychology is proving that wisdom, self-mastery, courage, and love, the cardinal virtues of ancient wisdom and modern science are the essence of a good, noble, happy, in the deepest sense, eudaimonic life. And then when you do that, you naturally live for something bigger than yourself. Right. And that leads us to the second tattoo, which is you're heroic. So the etymology of hero, again, hero doesn't mean tough guy or killer of bad guys. In ancient mm -hmm. Greece, they picked the word for hero that meant protector. So a hero is a protector, and a hero has strength for two, and their secret weapon, according to Plutarch, is love. Mm -hmm. So it's love that gets you to have the courage to do what needs to get done, whether you feel like it or not, and the self-mastery to do what needs to get done, whether you feel like it or not. And I offer that all of us are called to be heroes in the truest etymological sense. So whether it's for our kids or our communities or you know the values we believe in, I think we need heroes today more than ever before. That's why you'll see two tattoos, you know, on that's either awesome. forearm, Arata, Heroic, and that's literally my entire life's work in two tattoos and everything yeah. that I've dedicated my life to. That's awesome. You know, my definition of courage is to act with love as opposed to act I didn't with know fear. That. Yeah. Right. And I think that yeah, yeah, down the it makes sense because, you know, in order to act with love, you have to be in your heart and, and core in French is heart. And so it's, yep. it's feeding the courage wolf is opening your heart and acting with love. And that's courage. Feeding the fear wolf is staying in your head and being full of anxiety and not curiosity, but contraction around what's the unknown, right? And that discomfort, mm. stepping into that. So that's staying in that, not closing the gap, you know? Yep. So fascinating. Yeah. I love, that. And I love how the ancient philosophies really, they're so perennial. You know, I was steeped in the yogic philosophies, but when I'm, when I mirror them against, you know, the ancient Greeks, they fit hand in the glove. They all inform each other. Yeah, absolutely. And then two things on that. Aristotle says that courage is the number one virtue. And to mm. your point, it comes from the word that means heart. So the way I've adapted that is his take is that, you know, just as the heart pumps blood to all the other vital organs in your arms and legs, courage is the virtue that vitalizes all the other virtues. Mm. Because if when things get hard, you don't know how to stand up and have that unbeatable mind and show up with that courage driven by love, then it doesn't matter what you think and what you know to be true if you don't have that ability to act in that moment. So yeah, super inspiring and um, exciting to imagine creating a culture in which that becomes the default. And that's hard work. And which is another reason why I love Campbell is, you know, follow your bliss. He wishes he had said, <laughs> emphasize, follow your grunt. It isn't just good times and, you know, it's right. supposed to be hard. And when we get that part of it right, that the scraped knuckles aren't part of a phase. If you aren't scraping your knuckles, metaphorically or literally, then you're not doing it right. And when we get that mindset, you know, locked in, then all those things we used to be interpreting as signs we're doing it wrong become a sign. No, no, no. We're, we're striving to be that next best version of ourselves. It's supposed to be hard. Let's use it as fuel for that next stage of our growth. And hopefully we get more graceful. You know, we're not sinking down into the super lows anymore, but we allow those inevitable um, challenging times to be signs we're on the right path and challenges to step up and show up as our best selves rather than threats to our 
sense of self and all that good stuff. Right. I think it's fascinating that when left alone, right, unexamined, you know, the inertia of our culture has been to backslide or to stoop to the lowest common denominator, which is to basically say, yeah, the easy path is the way. Anything that makes you comfortable is good, right? And to not struggle. You know, I believe that that is, has done so much damage in our culture and has, has led to, you know, this incredible dystopian kind of state of fear and anxiety and doubt and depression, and then victimization to be countered with dependency, right? Dependency on corporations and, and government. And so it's almost like a form of slavery. I, I keep thinking about the, the movie Matrix the past year, and I'm like, wow, we're practically living a version of yep. that. Yeah. Don't you think? And so this, this is why it's so important, the work that you're doing, the work we're doing, and others like us who are, who are pushing back against that narrative. And saying, you know what, it's time for us to take control back. Take control back first of yourself and your mind. And then through disciplined habits, take control back of your life. And then let's do this with our families, our communities, until we have hundreds of millions and a billion people who have taken control back. Yep. Not like to fight against some unseen force, but to take, just take control back of your life. Because yep. like you said, uh -huh. Campbell said, if you create the reality you want to see in your mind, it'll happen at scale, you know, globally. 100%. So then there's so many parallels there, of course. In how I see things, a few things came to mind. You know, I'm, I'm essentially a strive to be a practicing stoic, so deeply inspired by that approach, as you know. But one of my favorite authors, Ward Farnsworth, who's a dean of the University of Texas Law School, says, you got to make a choice, the good life or the good mood. And our mm -hmm. society has seduced us to think that the hedonic pleasures are where it's mm -hmm. at, the extrinsic stuff, the stuff that makes you feel great right now, the TikTok video vis-a-vis -vis the deep practice of whatever it is that you know is best for you. So it's hedonic versus you daimon. That's the juxtaposition. And then you have your daimon, and the diminutive of daimon, which is your soul, is demon. So again, this isn't a new challenge, and this is what's important. This is a 2,500-year-old challenge that the Stoics like to talk about Socrates talking about Hercules. So Hercules, you know, the mythological ideal of the ancient Stoics and Greeks, is said to have been on a path before he was Hercules. He's walking down this, you know, literally a path, like Campbell's, you know, dark part of the woods or whatever, and two goddesses approach him. One rushes in front of the other, kind of butts in front of him. She's all made up and preening. You could almost see her on Instagram taking a <laughs> selfie. And she says, Hercules, follow me, and you're going to have a great life. It's going to be easy. You're just going to relax. It's going to be amazing. Here's so my friends call me happiness. Right. And she lies. Yeah. Her real name is Vice. Right. Mm -hmm. Anyway, the other goddess sits there patiently. Then she steps forward. She's got a stern look to her. She's beautiful, but unpretentious and stern. And she says, Hercules, you follow me and I promise you, your life will not be easy. But those challenges will make you worthy of having the respect of the gods. Boom. Her name was Arte. So mm -hmm. she was the goddess of Arte. And of course, Hercules chose wisely and his life was unbelievably challenging. Mm -hmm. And that is what made him great. So this is a 2,500-year-old challenge that in our modern world is exponentially worse mm -hmm. because you can subsume yourself in a attention economy, mind-hacking virtual reality of TikTok or Facebook or soon-to-be meta, which is a whole other conversation. Mm -hmm. And that's scary when we don't have the structures to go to war against this. And I was going to mention your yogic background. I love the fact that Gandhi, who is also on my wall back there, mm -hmm. his Bible was the Bhagavad Gita, of course, mm -hmm. the sacred text of Hinduism. And of course, that sacred spiritual work is set on a battlefield, That's a right. real battlefield that metaphorically represents the battle within ourselves between what? The daimon and the demon, the best mm -hmm. part of us and the worst part of us. But it's a war. It's a war between those aspects. And then if you look outside, I think we're in an invisible war right now. 100%. And we've talked about it a little bit. You know, I've gone back and forth with mags on this. You know, in some ways, you got Frankel and Churchill and Eisenhower on that side of my wall that remind me of the last great war. This is even more pernicious because it's subtle and the enemy isn't identified. And to me, every single challenge we're facing from the pandemic levels of, you know, whatever with COVID and pandemic levels of diabetes and cancer and depression and anxiety and polarization politically and environmental degradation. It's very simple. It's vice versus virtue. Mm -hmm. And the fact that we can't name it, I think is one of the most dangerous things. So 
I love the metaphor of the, of the matrix. Mm-hmm. And I literally feel like that's what we're offering is blue pill right. or red pill, your call. Take that's the right. blue pill, you're back asleep. Take well, the red pill, you're going to wake up and have to do something about at it. At scale yeah. with the globe, the human population, there is a lot of profit in vice. There is an extremely intense motivation for many interests to keep people in vice because it's profitable. Which requires heroic leadership. But then that's not any challenge. If you look back and, and you look at the most profitable industries 2,500 years ago, it wasn't virtue. The right. Stoics have been saying this forever. Of, God, right. everyone wants to feel good. And the Stoics said, when you're done listening to a lecture from me, you shouldn't feel like you just got a, went to the spa. You should feel like you just left the hospital and I performed <laughs> surgery on you. It should be painful. You should be stunned at the end of my talk. Not like the, you know, <laughs> rhetorically you know, sophisticated sophist who they applauded at the end. You made me feel good about myself. Wow. Wow, you, you just give me a new perspective pain. on public speaking. I'm going to have to try that out. No, seriously. You should <laughs> if you're be, not crying you and puking. <laughs> no, I swear to God, and I'm still almost nauseous from a row I just did, too. I was thinking of you, like, <laughs> you know, that willingness to suffer and to experience pain. You, you made the point. We are so caught up, we are so bubble wrapped, and everyone in self-help and otherwise tells us it should be easy, it should be quick. That is the most pernicious lie. And that's obvious. But we got to call that out. We do. Then we yeah. start reversing everything and we get anti-fragile about everything and we get to work. And then again, it's an invisible war within ourselves, first and foremost. I got uh, Lincoln up there as well. Mm. And each of my heroes, I meditate for an hour every morning now and spend you know, 15, 20 minutes. Each of them speaks to me. They give me a, a demand and a, a kind of a command. Sounds like Napoleon Hill. <laughs> Yeah, you know, my take with the heroes, exactly. I'm channeling them, my board of heroic advisors. But, you know, Lincoln tells me every morning, win the Civil War within and outside. Mm -hmm. So there's this, you know, battle that's going on moment to moment to moment. And I believe it's only won via Arte and a fierce commitment to playing the ultimate game well, noticing where culture has seduced us fully take that red pill as often as you need to, Mm -hmm. you know, and and get to that level of clarity where you're stepping up. So I love that distinction right there. Like awakening is taking the red pill and you can never go back. That's awakening. But then you take on a great responsibility because then it means you got to show up every day and do the work or else then you become almost, uh, you're like a double loser because you've awakened, but now you've not done anything about it. You know the problem. And you know the answer, but you're not doing anything about it. And I've seen that so often because it's hard work. And many people don't, you know, they shirk from the hero's journey. They collapse back into limitation and and lack and they play the victim. They say, oh, maybe it's just not me or I'm not ready or I don't have the skills or maybe next lifetime. And that's a shame. You know, we need people to to not just wake up, but like Wilbur says, to grow up. Show up. Show up. Yeah. yeah. I was just going to go to Wilbur. And I was just going to say, I know that we both adore Ken and his work. So Ken Wilbur, dates and stages. It's easy to go to a weekend event, walk on fire, twist yourself into a pretzel yoga, <laughs> and then come home. So you experience the state of peak you know, experience or enlightenment, per se, perhaps, 10-day Vipassana meditation. We've all done whatever we've done. Then you come back to your life, and the question is, what stage of development are you at? Now, most of the self-help and personal growth world is not telling you that you need to ruthlessly focus on the tiny mundane things. They're telling you you need another retreat or another psychedelic or another state experience. And what I think we're telling them and what we architected the entire heroic app on is show up, not once in a while when you feel like it and not on New Year's Eve or after the weekend event, but moment to moment to moment and day by day. So one of the stories we have that I haven't shared with you yet that we're really excited about is we've got this thing where it's theory to practice. That's the entire heroic app. So again, somewhat briefly, how do we move from theory to practice? You don't need to read another book. You don't need to listen to another podcast. You need to mm-hmm. do what you already know you need to do to be at your best, which you've done in the past. Life isn't hard. What do you do when you're at your best? Guess what? Do that more often. Don't do the things you don't do. We have a two-step process. The first is every morning you need to recommit. So we have a one-minute recommitment process. And the way I'm going to tell the story in the app is, you know, David, I don't think I told you this, right? When you were on, um, David, uh, Michelangelo's statue, right? So the frame is, let's hop in a time traveling machine and go back in time to September 8, 1504. We're in Florence. 
We're outside, right? There's a 17-foot statue that's about to be unveiled. The great young artist, Michelangelo. His David, boom, the sheet's pulled off. You can see what has become the most iconic hero in history. Right there, boom, there's David. But the question is, what moment did Michelangelo choose to capture in David's life? No one's known the answer. I'll I'll pose that rhetorically, but do you have a, a thought on that? Oh, so the look on David's face is a particular moment. Well, that makes sense. I imagine it's probably when he chooses to confront the fact that he's been complacent and to go forward. The first and to... hero, the first true in the trenches hero to whom I've asked that question answers the question correctly. That's absolutely right. Mm-hmm. So the way I usually need to say, answer it is, oh, I don't know. And then I say, well, it wasn't his moment after he slew David. I'm Goliath. When he was, quote, officially a hero. It's the most saying, heroic oh, shit, moment. I have to do this. Dude, I and I light, up, I light up right now. And if yeah. you look at it, scholars say that there is incomparable intensity, ferocious intensity in David's poise. It's the moment at which he decides he is going to step up and strive to, without guarantee, serve heroically. Mm. And again, okay. full body goosebumps right I've now. I've got energy flowing so, through my body with that one too. Just dude, our baby. whole... And putting myself you know, into his body right there in his mind being like, holy shit, I've got it. Oh my this. God. It's no life or death. And he literally is going to die or succeed. No other way about it. And his entire, I mean, there was a one-on-one confrontation there. So his entire community, he stepped up, tiny little David, with his slingshot against David and said, That's I'm going to stand up in the face of that enormous challenge. And so our heroic challenge is we need you to do that. Each and every one of us is inspired by a story like that or Harry Potter or Matrix because you are the hero we've been waiting for. Quit looking outside yourself. Look in the mirror. And then don't commit at the end of a weekend that inspired you. Every single morning while your aura score data is sinking, we have this process where we're going to help you commit. Tap, 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 tap. I I commit to showing up as this energy best version of myself, this work and love and these virtues. And I'm going to do this today. Um, We call that our heroic commitment process. And the idea is you can't do that once in a while. Right. You got to show up every single day. Earn your trident. I mean, I Earn got Mags every day. When Mags gave us a tour, Emerson and I, my son, you know, he gave us, you know, the card that you may have gotten and the new graduates get. Congratulations. You just went through the hardest training on earth. I didn't now get you that. You got to go through it every day. <laughs> I okay, got the well, Honor Man Award, trident. but I didn't get the card. I got to ask. I know you did. You got pinned, but that trident represents, you, you know, and obviously you talk. Oh, I see what you're saying. Mags the trident is the card. Yeah. You've got to earn it every day. No, I literally have a card in my wallet that mags gave to me that says earn your trident every day okay. and it's the first thing i see when i pull out my credit card and right behind it i've got mags's business card where he says the deed is all not the glory the humility of the bowed head in your eagle the only place from my understanding that the american eagle ever shows up with a bowed head the humility mm-hmm. of the hero is i need to be worthy today i need to be worthy today i need to be worthy today and i need to serve as heroically as i can i need to channel my inner david not once in a while or when I feel like it, but every single day, especially when I don't feel like it. And that's the source of true confidence, obviously, but importantly, but that's the idea is commit right now today to being that best version of yourself. Got me fired up there. Megs is Mike Madurachi, who's a good friend of ours and um, is the um, mental toughness mentor, or really, you know, leadership mentor at Bud's. And he was a force master chief of the seals, just an incredible guy and fully bought into, you know, Arate and the principles and teaching those at buds and mentoring them and mentoring some of the things that we do with unbeatable mind. So it's really neat to see our warriors picking up on the ancient philosophies and becoming whole warriors again. And that's been my mission from the very beginning when I started seal. Mm-hmm. I was like, I, I want to create a whole warrior. I don't want people to come in and just go down range and play whack-a-mole and not understand the full context of this battle that's going on between, you know, the daemon and demon and, and even spiritual warfare, you know, if we're going to send people in harm's way to represent good, then let's create people who understand what that is and can reflect that and bring it and show up with that. Now, I wanted to shift focus here because you had your David moment at the election of 2020. You had mm. a David moment where you looked at where you were and you looked at the future and said something, mm. something momentous has to change. You had like a second awakening and you, you woke up and said, screw it, I'm going to do this. I have to do this. I have to stare down mm. at my Goliath. And you mm. transformed your successful business, very successful business that I invested in, optimized into this new heroic platform. So tell us about that awakening and kind of the journey that you've been on here. 
Right on. And thank you again for introducing uh, Mags and I and for supporting me throughout the years. And yeah, woke up middle of the night, which I never do. You know, I sleep is a sport for me. That nice. aura score, you know. <laughs> Turn that into an Olympic sport. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, totally. And politics aside, and, and earnestly politics aside, I woke up and I'm like, really? I got a nine-year-old kid, a four-year-old kid, and I'm a proud American, you know, and as a kid, I got my Ronald Reagan button on. And it's like, look, we, we can do better than this, you know, and it's time to do something about it. And as you know, I've been a hermit. All I did was read and write and teach. Right. In my past life, you know, I built and sold two social platforms, and I have waited 15 years for someone to build an alternative to, to Facebook. If you've watched The Social Dilemma, you know the unintended catastrophic consequences of the attention economy. Right. Um, and I decided in that moment, I have this philosophy that I practice. It's called targeted thinking. So frankly, I was appalled. I looked at it. And I'm like, really? I know. This is the wow. best we can do, you know? right? Exactly. Yeah. I mean, seriously, it was one of those, like, I really get really kind of knocked. And it was a minute or two or three, but it was one of those, like, just almost shocked and like a, a rageful, wow, really? You know, and then my practice is two parts, well, third part, really, but targeted thinking. So I'm a big fan of Aristotle and teleological thinking. Our heroic icon is the most taught point in a bowstring, representing Apollo, who was the patron god of philosophy, who was an archer. So a good philosopher takes aim at what they want. So I said to myself, what do I want? Step one. And the immediate answer was, I want to create a more noble and virtuous world, principally for my kids, nine and four years old. Perfect. Step one. Step two, what are you going to do about it? And the immediate answer was, I'm getting out. It's time for me to step up and show up, create an answer to the social dilemma. And heroic, I knew the name, and it was heroic. We're going to create heroic public benefit corporation. And so in that moment, heroic was born, which will be a social training platform. So I'll turn to Facebook that's all about moving from theory to practice to mastery together in community. Um, so we can talk about that. But then three days later, I saw that the crowdfunding regulations were changing from a million dollar max to five million. And it was another cascading epiphanal moment. I didn't think about it. I just had a hit. We're going to be the first company ever raise five million dollars from a crowd. Fast forward six weeks, we filed with the SEC. We sent out a long letter. You never know until you send it out. Virtue of courage was exercised. You know, of course you have a moment. You should pause before you do something like mm -hmm. that, you know? Mm -hmm. Boom, send. Within 24 hours, we had over $5 million of express commitment. Mm -hmm. Within 100 hours, we had over $11 million. We wound up raising $11 million and made history as the first company to ever raise $5 million via the new regulations. And then I immediately hired the best product development company in the world, a company called MetaLab that created Slack Tinder, God bless Tinder. I've been with my wife for 15 years, but they invented the swipe right, swipe left. Right. And they did Uber Eats and a bunch of other companies. And they're architecting at a beautiful level what we intend to make an answer to the social dilemma, that social training platform. And I, I really appreciate the way you framed it because frankly, I hadn't put myself in the David moment in that context, but that mm -hmm. was very much the sense of what I felt of I personally need to play my role well, however humbly, yet hopefully heroically well. But I, I've never seen the, uh, you so origin. fiercely intense in your gaze, right, in all the years I've known you. So that fierce intensity in your mission, everything was crystallized in that moment. Like you said, everything came mm. together, your entire life's work, both as an entrepreneur and a, you know, a business leader, as well as a, as a philosopher and teacher. And it all came together. And then, boom, it crystallized into this laser beam focus which you've maintained mm. and will continue to maintain. So that's cool to see. It's, fun. it's been fun to watch. Well, I'll tell you what, you know what I do every day? I simplify my battlefield and I have front side focus. You're in my DNA, you know, and in our soul's DNA. And, and I appreciate that. That means a lot to me and all in. I feel like this is the moment literally that I've been training for. And again, my job now is not about me. It's about being the guide who then invites the other guides to train the heroes. It's a platform so our whole mission heroes. is we train heroes. So this is it. We train heroes, a global movement where personal transformation leads to massive social change is the first thing when you look at our website, you know, we train heroes, a global movement where personal transformation leads to massive social change. Um, and then I've also embraced that ambition, you know, of Lincoln, he was fiercely ambitious. And thankfully, he was, but for something bigger than himself, he wasn't Instagram followers, he was being worthy of being remembered by his fellow men and women for leading them and serving them profoundly. True heroic leadership 
again, I aspire to embody some of those ideals, which is why I've got them up there and why, you know, I have such deep respect for you and for our communities to go out and and more than anything, what it did, we had 2,500 investors from 75 countries. And what I think it speaks to, one of my advisors said is, the world is hungry for heroes. The world wants to see something different, you know, for ourselves, our kids, their kids. And, and then my whole thing is, quit looking outside of yourself. Look in the mirror. Who are you at your best? And what do you need to do to close that gap? Not once in a while, not someday, but literally moment to moment to moment. And again, that's what we aspire to create, that community of people training together and doing the hard work, mm-hmm. celebrating and learning from one another and truly going out and changing the world. What I also love is your generosity, your generosity of spirit and sharing. But also, if you're looking at this podcast on the show notes, you'll see a couple links. And what Brian has done is he's taken his whole entire optimized catalog of philosopher's notes and master classes. I, I know there's philosopher's notes on my books in there and all these great luminary leaders and you're giving it away for free. That's awesome. So if you want to get this incredible repository of wisdom, then go, you know, check out the notes and go claim it for free. That's extraordinary. And the other thing is people who join your coaching program, you know, they've got an incredible experience and knowledge. And of course, coaching means I own this knowledge and not from a proprietary standpoint. I mean, I own it internally and to the point where I can bring it to someone else. So that's the first step of real mastery is to be able to teach. And your coaching program, you know, you're basically discounting that by over 70% so that you can get more coaches who can then bring this news to the world. So we're, you're really democratizing access to wisdom. And that's how we're going to reach scale because ultimately all information is free. But courage, wisdom, temperance, and justice are not free. They have to be earned. And so free knowledge, well, knowledge is skin deep, but to work with that knowledge every day and then to coach it, teach it, mentor it, and live it, that's where the juice is at. And we're trying to do that at scale. Yeah, beautifully said, and, and thank you. And yeah, so the Optimize used to be a premium membership. Tens of thousands of people from nearly every country in the world have signed up for it. And we just made it free. We unlocked it. And it's been, you know, 70,000 people signed up in the first 45 days before we really even did anything. And we actually, you know, optimize.me slash Mark Divine is where we parked your okay. three notes. You can go optimize. straight there. Optimize.me slash Mark Divine. Is that the Mark same Divine. URL that someone can go sign up for free or how does that work? Yeah, 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 exactly. So go there and you'll be able to sign up for free, but you'll also get, we have three notes on your books. So we've got Unbeatable Mind. We've got Staring Down the Wolf. We've got The Way of the Seal. I believe we also might have a snip because you've been part of our master. We're calling the coach program mastery. Now the mastery program, everything is free. The 600 philosophers now three of Mark's great books distilled into six page PDFs, 20 minute MP3s, all of ancient wisdom, dozens of stoic books, like 70 positive psychology books. I went through it and I'm like, wow, I was, <laughs> let's go, you know, so grit and, uh, you know, all of Martin Seligman's books, yeah. all of that stuff. Yeah. Anyway, 600 philosophers now, a bunch of classes and other stuff, all free at optimize.me slash Mark Divine. Then we have what is a scientifically proven 300-day mastery program. And again, nod to the Spartans. Everything we do is, no, 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 this is tough. It was priced at $1,000, which was market-wise, we were told under, you know, priced and astonishing mm, value. Was. But we, we always said, yep, you're not going to pay, you know, as much as you would at other programs, but you're going to pay. You're going to pay because, you know, to get through this, you're going to need to do the work and do the reps to move from theory to practice to mastery. Anyway, 300-day program, Sonia Libomirsky, a leading uh, well-being researcher, conducted scientific research on it. And she said that if she didn't do the research herself, she would have thought the data was fake. The changes were so profound in a sense of purpose and connection to your best self and confidence and energy, et cetera. So anyway... That will be at, at the URL as well. It's called the Mastery Program. Used to be a thousand bucks. It's now three hundred dollars, and you can bring a friend. And the idea is unlock, optimize, catalyze heroic. And we've gone through a tough two years. It's been tough, obviously, for everybody. Let's go make twenty twenty three the best year of our lives. And I mean that earnestly. Use all of those challenges as fuel. What's been working in your life? What hasn't? It's time to step up. I and mean, hopefully, our our content. More wisdom and less time is one of our things can help guide you in the process of you becoming the best, most heroic version of yourself. Hoo-yah. You've gotten me fired up half a dozen times today, Mark. This is good. <laughs> hey, what's the launch date for heroic? 
and the, the app itself. All that stuff is now optimized. And then the launch date for Heroic <laughs> is April 9th. So we've got a launch party. We're live streaming my favorite band called The Score. And you can sign up for that as part of the process for uh, 35 bucks. So we're doing $70 a year, but half off for the uh, first year of founding members, April 9th, Giddy. And then the social platform, when we launch, it's just a training platform. Mm -hmm. You're going to come in, you're going to commit to hitting targets, and then you're going to hit them. And mm -hmm. you're going to get a splash of dopamine, mm -hmm. boom, Meta Lab designs, et cetera. But mm -hmm. it's kind of like a calm for heroes well, we're not trying to get you to reduce your stress. We're teaching you how to eat it like an energy bar mm -hmm. meets masterclass for heroes meets habit tracking for heroes. Mm -hmm. Because there isn't really one app out there that's like the best habit tracking app. Mm -hmm. So right. that's the thing we aspire to do at a, at a 10x or to use your words, 20x level. That launches April 9th. The social side of it launches in October. We're really excited about both of those things. Are they going to be yeah, gonna say, integrated, those platforms, or will they be two separate things? They're going to be complementary. So mm -hmm. we're not going to integrate. What we're going to do with Heroic is I'm the guide for what we're calling basic training, unapologetic. Mm -hmm. We went dark mode with Heroic. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, Tesla for personal growth is our style, literally dark mode, black with some mm -hmm. splashes of red, just like your chair right now. And then we're going to invite you. Cal Newport, you know, all my other, you know, favorite friends and teachers to be guides for your domain of expertise mm -hmm. and to create a community where you're helping lead us in your formative habits that, again, you write all your books to get us to do certain things, mm -hmm. not to consume more information. So how do we do those things in community? Cal Newport actually called a battle group. Mm -hmm. It's a battle group of people going out and doing more deep work and deep living and, and all of those things. So anyway, that's the basic idea. You know, you got the guide leading the heroes and all of us going out and hitting it hard together. And the social platform is the answer to Facebook. Is it going to be algorithmic that prevents kind of negativity from seeping in? How are we going to do Well, this? there's a lot of things there. So the first, and you know, longer strategic chat, but the brief take on that is the problem with Facebook principally and others like them is they're in the attention economy. So they make money. You, you think Facebook's the product. Mm -hmm. It's not. Yeah, You're you the are. product. Right. So you are. You're conscious. Of it. Now, that's dangerous. Especially dangerous when the individuals running these companies have what some could call moral bankruptcy, which is a whole other job. <laughs> so they don't have your best interest in mind, to say the least. They want to sell your attention to the highest bidder. And again, I'm a capitalist, so I have zero issues with the idea of creating profitable businesses at scale, et cetera. But what I want to do is prove that you can do it at scale and outcompete businesses like that when you run it with our set. So this, is, again, is our mission that we're committed to. Now, when you get out of the attention economy, we don't make money hacking your attention. You, as a prospective community member, will pay us only if we help you become the best, most heroic version of yourself. There will be no ads. We need to earn your trust. We need to earn our, our trident with you every single day. We're either worth 35, 70 bucks a year or we're not. That changes everything. Because now we've got to architect something at a world-class level that is worthy of you using it for a minute in the morning and coming back and hitting it throughout the day because you know it makes you better. So yeah, that's the first most important thing. And the moment someone's paying $70 for it, okay, things have changed. Mm -hmm. And then we're going to have a zero, no a-holes allowed policy. Now, again, that needs to be defined, and we will with the community support, but it's not that hard to tell. Mm -hmm. The stuff people say on social platforms, these are good, generally, quote unquote, good people who are nice if you're mowing your lawn and waving at them. But when you get online and you're anonymous and you're polarized, all of a sudden you become a troll. <laughs> so I think when you create an environment in which we're committed to the same ideals, you can bring out the best and the same person who might be that guy or gal on a social network in a different environment, but our tolerance for that is going to be precisely zero. Mm -hmm. The moment you are that troll, you are not allowed in our community. It'll be very easy for us to technologically, we will make you invisible. We don't need your toxic stew. Now, we'll need, need to be nuanced on this so it's not obnoxious and you know, oriented in one slant or another, but we're going to have to figure this out. It's a mm -hmm. huge challenge for us to figure out how you do it. But the thing we want to do is create intimacy. So the first connection is with my wife. I want to see what she's doing, you know, and I want to support her. Then me and you as, mm -hmm. as brothers in this with others who are really committed and then you know, the optimized community, the unbeatable community, there's a certain shared ethos there mm -hmm. where your guys and gals, when they get together, aren't, they bring their best selves, but we want to bring it offline. That's the trick. 
So we want you to spend as little time on our app as possible and then push you back into your real life. That's right. So, you know, Zuckerberg, I, I finally am willing to pick a fight with Metaverse. I haven't called him out or picked a fight, but Metaverse, that's some scary stuff. Virtual scary. world, my kids aren't living in that world created by Zuckerberg. I'm sorry, full stop. So our juxtaposition is, what do you want? A virtual reality or a virtuous reality? Hmm. So we want to bring you offline, connect you to your family, connect you to your communities. We're going to do a ton of stuff to get together hmm. offline and real world connections, et cetera. But it's going to be a huge lift for us. And I'm really, really excited to um, give it our best shot and create something hopefully truly great. Well, you got your slingshot at the ready. So let's go. Confident that, <laughs> that you'll land your mark. And I love this idea. And I share it of uh, using technology for virtue because technology is just technology. So, you know, it's not technology that's the problem, it's the human use of it. And so we want to use it for virtuous things and give people an alternative that is every bit as exciting, but is going to bring them along the path of righteousness and eudaimonia yeah so. we call that heroic technology so inhumane is what tristan harris is trying to deal with so if you've watched joe rogan's recent show mm-hmm. inhumane technology getting worse and worse and worse mm-hmm. so his nonprofit is called humane technology so what would humane technology look like and i say that's fantastic but mm-hmm. it's kind of like the psychology movement moving from horribly depressed to not depressed right. okay so inhumane vis-a-vis humane is better but my question is What's the other end of the spectrum from inhumane? It's heroic. So inhumane, humane, what would heroic technology look like? So I hired and we spent several million dollars for MetaLab to create our products. We're doubling that next year. Mm -hmm. We will be their biggest project next year. So we want to show the world what heroic technology looks like, where you use the absolute best of behavioral design. We're unapologetic. Yes, I'm going to splash you with the most addictive dopamine you could imagine. That Tinder swipe I mentioned, I knew the moment I heard of MetaLab, another epiphanal moment. They're going to come up with our bowstring moment. We're not going to have a slingshot. We're going to have a bowstring. So when you commit to a target, you're going to light up an archer's target. You're going to tap it. Little dopamine, yep, you said you're going to meditate today or show up with your kids today. Then when you do it, you come back, touch the target with your finger, drag it back like Angry Birds haptic tension, but it will be a bowstring. And then swoosh as you get your dopamine. Getting people addicted to virtue. (laughs) This is it. it. This is heroic technology. Where, and again, Seneca talked about this 2,000 years ago. He said, how much better to pursue a straight course such that you arrive at a point where doing what is best for you is what you most enjoy, where the good life becomes the good mood. And doing that virtuous act, you couldn't pay me not to meditate or to be present when I'm connecting with you or my kids or whatever. That's just when I feel best is when I'm being my best. Mm -hmm. So that's the arc that, again, ancient wisdom has agreed with modern science on. Get your neurochemistry firing on doing what's best for you and feel best when you do that. That's the ultimate challenge and what I'm most excited to, um, you know, architect a platform that can, uh, again, be a demonstration of that at scale as a counterpoint to a lot of the other technology platforms out there that are doing precisely the opposite. (laughs) (laughs) Who yada that, Brian? Well, it's been a real uh, joy to talk to you. A great work you're doing, and it's fun to be part of it and to know you. And um, we offer your support, of course, and on your journey. So anything we can do to help out. Excited to see the future as it unfolds. Go create a great one together, man. Appreciate yeah. you, brother. Yeah, that's Brian Johnson, founder, CEO of Heroic. Check out optimize.me forward slash Mark Devine to learn more about you know, his incredibly generous offer to give you his entire library for free. And to, you know, track them at Heroic or Brian Johnson or, you know, where where should people go to learn about your project, Brian? Yeah, so that's exactly right. Optimize.me slash Mark Devine is the best place to jump straight into um, my work through you. I mean, that's absolutely the best way to start. And then Heroic.us is where um, Heroic is. We're launching that. Really excited. It's going to be a clean, you know, April 9th, we're launching a a clean kind of landing page there in the early part of the year. So it's a little rough right now, but that's the, uh, what's coming down the pipe. Optimize on me slash Mark Devine is probably the best place to start for now. Awesome, Brian. That's the Unbeatable Mind podcast. Thanks so much for joining me. Um, and I hope you found value in that and incredible work that Brian's doing. So let's support him. Let's back him up, especially with his launch uh, so we can push back against the, the evil behemoths, right? Who are trying to control our attention and keep us in a suboptimal state for profit. It's no bueno. So we're going to take control back. So thank you for being part of that mission. And uh, thank you for your support of, of me and Unbeatable Mind. Until next time, this is Mark Devine, your host. hoo